Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Naz Beheshti about lessons from her book, Pause, Breathe, Choose, Become the CEO of Your Well-Being. Naz Beheshti, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you for having me, John. It's really a pleasure. I'm excited to have a conversation with you today about your book in part and really exploring the role of wellness and mindfulness within organizations and what we can do uh, to better take care of ourselves and our people uh, within our teams. As we get started today, I wanted to share Naz's bio with everybody. Naz Beheshti is the author of Pause, Breathe, Choose, Become the CEO of Your Well-Being. She is an executive wellness coach, speaker, Forbes contributor, and CEO and founder of Promenaz, a corporate wellness company improving leadership effectiveness, employee engagement and well-being, company culture, and business outcomes. Clients include Nike, J.P. Morgan Chase, Omega Institute, UCSF, Columbia University, and Stanford University. She lives in New York City with her husband, and you can visit her online at www.nazbaheshti.com. Again, it is a real pleasure to have you with me today, and uh, I appreciate your willingness to share your insights and experience with my audience. One of the things you talk about in in your book, um, or and you credit Steve Jobs as your first boss and mentor. Many People, though, say, you know, he's a really intense guy. He had a reputation for being difficult to work with. Um, Maybe you could talk a little bit about your early career, Steve Jobs as a mentor, how you connected and interacted with him uh, and how that experience inspired you to write your book. Sure. So Steve was my first boss, a mentor right out of college. I got my uh, job as his executive assistant at Apple which at the time didn't realize how influential and impactful it would be for the rest of my career because it was my first job. I had nothing to compare it to. And at the time I was just, you know, doing my job and supporting Steve and, you know, loving it, but also really stressed. You know, he was a very intense man and with good reason He was an iconic visionary and laser focused and demanded excellence. And he was a perfectionist. And I understood that part of him because I'm also somewhat of a perfectionist uh, as well. And um, in hindsight, when I look back at my experience working with him, I really realized that he taught me the most important lesson, the most valuable lesson that I carry with me every day, which is well-being drives success. He prioritized his self-care. He had to, to keep up the energy, the creativity, innovation, being laser focused uh, through his self-care practices. So he meditated daily. He had regular physical activity, a trainer several times a day, I'm sorry, several times a week. And he, you know, had strong relationships with his family and ate really healthily and just had a holistic approach to his well-being, which I think is uh, the main reason and fundamental to sustaining his his success. Yeah, well, and that's super interesting to hear about, you know, the, your firsthand experience with him, because you hear the stories and you hear about the reputation, you hear about the intensity, and I've been around other people that are equally as intense, probably not quite as as uh, iconic and visionary and in genius, you know, as he was, but, but equally intense people. Mm -hmm. And I always wonder about how you can sustain that level of engagement and activity 
over a long period of time. And many people just can't. Uh, and, and so that's why you, you see ebbs and flows. He was one that always just seemed to produce and it, it's great to hear about the mindfulness practices and the, the, the self-care that he uh, was involved in and just making sure he was taking care of himself each and every day. And, you know, be, working with a boss who's very intense, that's an intense experience, right? That, that right. can be stressful. It can induce anxiety. Um, but I also imagine, and you can speak more to this, but I imagine, you know, being able to look to him and seeing how he prioritized self-care that that also uh, reinforced to you the importance of it and gave you permission to do the same for yourself when you're early in your career. Well, at the time, actually not. I wasn't as self-aware to do that and I was young. And so, you know, luckily I was blessed with good genes and, you know, high metabolism and, you know, just, I had the energy and it was later as I got older and wiser and things weren't the same as, you know, when I was younger that I realized this is not sustainable. And, you know, I need my sleep. I need to eat well, you know, uh, like real food that gives me energy, not fake food, you know, convenience food um, that drains my energy and makes mm -hmm. me feel, you know, fatigued and foggy. And then um, my mindfulness practice came much later. So I actually, it was really looking back, you know, and connecting the dots and realizing, wow, Steve really cracked the code and he did it for himself. And now I'm going to try all that stuff later, not during the time that I was working for him. I was just hustling and trying to like keep sure, afloat sure. and, you know, really stressed and just, you know, trying to be a few steps ahead of Steve. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose that's kind of, a typical story for, you know, young adults who have boundless energy and ambition <laughs> and are, are ready to just to go, go, go. Right. Um, and, and, you know, it, it does, it does catch up with you eventually though. Yes. So, so that's, that's, that's great. <laughs> that's <sustainable>. great. That, <laughs> no, that's, so that's great that you, you were able to reflect on that later and, and uh, learn those lessons from him. And it, I don't know if you know this, it'd be interesting to know his history a little bit, if that's something he came to later in life, or if that's something uh, he had recognized earlier on and had practiced throughout his career. I don't know if you know that. Well, he went to India and had life-changing experience, which is similar to what happened to me as well before I started my company. But yeah, he got into meditation. I don't know how old he was or when, but it was prior. And, you know, he was actually more spiritual and in tune with himself and his intuition. Um, I don't know from when it started, but India was a really impactful yeah. uh, trip for him. Yeah, well, well, that's great to hear. So, so all of this experience was formative for you, young in your career, coming out, first job, um, mm -hmm. you know, first real professional experience, and then from there, though, you, you use that experience to catapult you into the rest of your career, and eventually, you you start your own business and you write a book. So, how how did all this um, shape you and influence you into um, writing that book? And then we can dig into some of of the lessons and the the topics that you discussed there. So after Apple, I worked at a tech startup and wore many hats at once and, you know, uh, gained lots of different skills working at a startup. And then I went to Yahoo, which was the Google of its time back, back in the day in the early 2000s and uh, then AstraZeneca. So I had over a decade of experience in, you know, large fortune 500 companies, as well as a small tech startup. And throughout that time, you know, it was great learning new skills, but after a while, after the novelty of a new job, you know, wore off, I was unfulfilled and lacking energy and just fulfillment. And um, I was also just really stressed too at, at certain times. And um, I, the companies didn't have any support. There was no corporate wellness programs, employee well-being. So I realized that there was a gap in the system and I wanted to fill that gap and help people who were like me stressed and didn't have the tools to manage stress and build resilience. So I think resilience is really important because when you are, when you do have to face something stressful or challenging, you are resilient and have the tools and, you know, energy to be able to, um, to optimize that experience in whatever way. 
And so I uh, went back to school to become a holistic health coach. I have a psychology background. I also um, got certified as a transformational coach and uh, advanced NLP practitioner. And I was in school, or I'm sorry, I was in um, school and work at the same time, eventually wanting to um, start my own business. But before I did that, I saved up all my vacation from um, AstraZeneca and took a month off and actually six weeks off and went to India. And I just, it was a life-changing experience, that trip. And the day I came back, I had some very meaningful uh, encounters with some, you know, um, monks and then the Dalai Lama for a few days I spent at his residence um, for a five-day teaching. And literally the day I returned from my trip, I quit my job and I started uh, Prana Naz. It, it was in the works. It wasn't something, you know, um, just really spontaneous. I was supposed to do it like in a year from then, but I just did it earlier because all the, everything was pointing towards like, you know, living an authentic life and not living one more day, um, doing something I don't want to be doing. And I couldn't, you know, I couldn't continue going to work every day, even though I had a ton of autonomy and I was doing really well at my job, but I just couldn't do it um, internally. Just I uh, needed to, you know, break free from the golden handcuffs, as I called it, and get out of my comfort zone and do what I was meant to be doing. So that's when I started Prana Naz, which is a corporate wellness company and do executive wellness coaching. And I truly love what I do and finally have found my purpose and passion. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, The Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, Ordinary Everyday Actions That Produce Extraordinary Results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data-driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. You know, we all go through that kind of a journey where we're trying to learn about ourselves and figure out the right path for us. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, some people are really lucky to tap into that really early on. Um, but most of us kind of zigzag and we do all right. sorts of things. Right. And, and ultimately we, we have to have some of those, um, those bad experiences, uh, or, or not even bad experiences, but we just have to have those experiences to, to then learn more about ourselves and understand mm -hmm. what, what drives us and what connects us and what is sustainable for us. And, and so I'm sure all the jobs you had that looking back now, you're like, oh, that wasn't a good fit for me. I'm sure it was a perfectly good fit for plenty of other people, but mm -hmm. you know, for you, it, it wasn't. And I felt the same way throughout my career as mm -hmm. I've been involved in different roles. And it's not that I'm not capable. It's not that I, you know, I'm not as equally skilled or, or um, competent as, as somebody else. It just wasn't for me. Like it wasn't a good fit and, and it was draining rather than invigorating. And I wasn't mm -hmm. excited about doing it. And, you know, so finding that thing, that passion, that purpose, uh, ultimately, I think that's what we need to try to do. And there, there's, there's, right. no, there's no shame, you know, in, in doing something that maybe isn't your favorite job to provide for your family. And, you know, if there's honor in all sorts of work, don't get me wrong, but mm -hmm. you know, if, if we are privileged enough to have the opportunity to chase our dreams and our passions, then we should, um, because it's going to lead to far more fulfilling life and we're going to be able to impact and help so many people in the process. 
Absolutely. And, and just to add, I don't actually regret any of the jobs I had, even though it wasn't the right fit long-term. I actually was really excited about all of them in the beginning. If not, I would have never done it, you know? Sure. So I learned a lot and all of the skills I learned and the experiences and the people I met have actually, um, they're interconnected with what I do today. I mean, just going to doctor's offices every day as a pharmaceutical sales rep, I learned that there is, again, a huge wellness gap that, you know, most of office visits um, are stress related and the doctors don't have the time to get to the root of the stress. You know, they prescribe something or say, you know, come back to me at this time after doing this, but they don't, they can't like sit there and they just don't have the time. That's not, they're not a coach, they're a doctor. So yeah. that's where I kind of also filled that gap of helping people manage their stress and really coach them and develop new healthy habits that are um, personalized for them. Yeah, that, that's great. Uh, and so let's di dive into your book a little bit more. I love the title, Pause, Breathe, Choose, Become the CEO of Your Well-Being. Um, the Pause, Breathe, Choose, you know, connecting to mindfulness and wellness that, that makes so much sense. Um, but I, I really love the, the, the subtitle to your book, becoming the CEO of your own well-being. Uh, maybe you can talk to that a little bit, why you chose that subtitle and how that uh, fits into your paradigm and framing of, of the work that you do. Well, I always think about uh, becoming the CEO of your well-being because it's really about taking charge of your life, you know, and well-being in a holistic sense of the word is being well in all areas of your life. It's not just about, you know, fitness and nutrition, where a lot of people think that that's, that's all health is, you know, but well-being is that broader topic and feeling of being happy and energized and you know, um, healthy and prosperous and just showing up as your best self in all areas of your life. And when I say, you know, um, the CEO of your well-being, I um, encourage readers and people to think of their well-being as like a company they run. And so when, um, you know, you're promoting good mental, emotional, physical, environmental, um, professional, and um, just overall emotional well-being, um, you are allowing all those different departments in your company to, to run well and smoothly. But as a CEO, you are, you know, in charge of making all the right choices for all those departments of your life to be running smoothly. And so, you know, asking yourself, are you operating or performing at the top of your game and like feeling happy and socially connected and purposeful and how are all these departments running and constantly checking in with that. And, um, you know, like your self-care, your career, your relationships, all those different departments in your life, are those running smoothly? And if not, what do you need to do to change that? Because you are the CEO, you have the ultimate power and authority to, to make the changes you need to make sure that your well-being company is thriving, right? So, I just love how empowering becoming the CEO of your well-being is, and not just empowering, but you know, it's really about um, living your best life. I mean, that's like the bottom line is when you are the CEO of your well-being, you are taking charge and living your best life. Yeah, I really love that, and it is a really powerful framing uh, because you know we life is tough, life is messy, and there's all these external pressures and constraints that are placed upon us. And so our, within our sphere of, of influence, you know, we have all these, these outside pressures and it's really, really easy to fall into the trap of just feeling the, like we're the victim of our circumstances. Um, but, but framing it as I'm the, my own CEO of my well being that puts the power back in your hands. It doesn't take away the fact that there are external pressures and constraints and we can't, you know, I can't magically, you know, wave my wand and all of a sudden get rid of all the social unrest and strife and political nonsense. And, you know, th those things are still going to be there and they're still going to impact you. Um, mm -hmm. But you can choose how you're going to respond to them and you can choose your, your daily habits uh, and, and that impact your, your well-being. You do have control over that. 
right. even if you don't have control over everything else outside of your your sphere of influence. And that's a powerful thing to remember. And frankly, it's it's something that a lot of people don't, um, you know, they don't remember about mm -hmm. themselves and their lives, and mm -hmm. and they, they end up falling into the trap of of just a fixed mindset and feeling stuck. And that's, right. that's like the worst thing in my mind is if you don't have any more hope and you just feel stuck and you just feel like beat down by the daily grind mm -hmm. and, and there's nothing you can do about it, you know, that's a really tough place to be. Absolutely. And that, that's what chronic stress is. If, if you're feeling that way, stuck, helpless, hopeless for more than six months, chronic stress is a killer stress. And that could lead to dis-ease. It could lead to suicidal ideation at worst case. I mean, it's really a terrible place to be. And right now, especially during um, the pandemic, I mean, things we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, finally, thankfully. However, it's been a year and people have been experiencing chronic stress. Mental health is at the top of, um, you know, HR's um, priorities right now and companies. And Actually, I'm doing more talks about becoming the CEO of your well being than I was pre pandemic, even though the book just came out, you know, recently. But everything in that book and my map method and become the CEO of your well being is what I've been teaching for about a decade now. So it's nothing new for me. It's just that I finally decided to put it in a book, thanks to Steve Jobs, who appeared in my dream and told me to write a book. But the concept, my method, all this is not new for me. It's, it's just finally having it accessible to everyone. And now uh, companies are really, um, it's resonating with them and saying, I, I want you to talk about becoming the CEO of your well-being because our employees need it. Yeah, yeah. I think everyone needs it. Um, yeah. And it's, it's an important reminder you know, to those who are listening, who say, I got it covered, you know, I, 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 I practice mindfulness, I exercise, I eat right, I, I get um, a good amount of sleep. Well, that's great. And, and I hope everyone listening falls into that camp. But regardless, it's still, we need the consistent reminder, because it's just so darn easy to fall back into old negative patterns of behavior, right. negative thought patterns, um, and nobody is immune from it. And particularly when you're in the middle of a pandemic uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, you have, you know, Black Lives Matter and, and everything around that, like just the, the, the difficulties that everyone is feeling um, mm -hmm. that we have to, to, to recommit ourselves to these practices. Um, one of the things that I know you talk a lot about is mindfulness. And maybe we can talk about some of the methods that you suggest uh, to practice mindfulness, but how it's really the foundation of authentic self-discovery and that life well lived. So for you, what is mindfulness? How do we practice it? Uh, and what, what do you suggest to your clients? Well, it's, I always meet my clients and people where they're at, whoever does not have a mindfulness practice. That's okay. Just, I, I talk about just starting really super small and creating a tiny habit of sitting still for two minutes, just two minutes, not 20 or 30 or 10, just two minutes and just focusing on your breath. I also um, recommend if, if they don't want to do that on their own, there's a ton of apps like, you know, Headspace and Calm to get started that way. But, you know, the trick and, and the, you know, the key is to just start really small so that you don't need a ton of intrinsic motivation to keep it up. And, you know, um, if you attach that small habit to a current uh, routine that you already do in the day, according to BJ Fogg, who's a behavior scientist at Stanford, who's cracked the code on how to create uh, sustainable tiny habits. It's, it's as simple as just like, you know, I have this RPM method, rise, pee, meditate. So it's right, I rise, I use the restroom. And right after that, I do that every single day, right after that, I meditate. So what is one thing that our, you know, listeners can, you know, attach a new habit, whether it's meditation or something to something they already do, whether it's brushing their teeth every morning, starting the coffee pot, whatever it is, and starting small, and then building up from there. But start small is, is key uh, to, to making it sustainable and growing from there. But really mindfulness for me is about awakening your mind and your heart from autopilot. And it really enables you to experience life unfolding in the present moment 
and unlocks your ability to tap into your intuition and creativity so that you can receive new information with a beginner's mind and develop a new perspective. So in short, mindfulness is really presence of heart and it unveils your truest self and desires. So who wouldn't want to be more mindful and get that, you know, heart head alignment and, um, you know, improve your basically emotional intelligence. Yeah. And that that's absolutely right. It does connect very closely to our emotional intelligence mm -hmm. and our, our EQ, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we have to be able, um, to have that personal alignment and connection. Otherwise we don't have much chance of meaningfully engaging, authentically engaging with those around us. And if I'm a leader and I have a team of people and I have the best of intentions, I want to, to support them and, and I want to, to help them maximize their potential, be their best selves. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to know how to do that. I'm not going to be able to connect with them mean, meaningfully, authentically at all. If I am not in tune with myself first, because we all have our own baggage and our own mm -hmm. biases and prejudices and, and just all the stuff of life that we end up projecting onto the people around us. If we're not first right. aware of what we're carrying around and, right. and that's, that's one of the, the problems and the things we see in relationships, whether it's, you know, home life, uh, work life, whatever, mm -hmm. um, pro problematic relationships, usually at the core, uh, there's just miscommunication and misunderstanding and it comes from from that misalignment absolutely i couldn't agree more with you and that's how i you know when i coach my clients it always starts from the inside and then when they themselves are you know mindful and everything i mean you just i echo everything you said um, because then they're able to um, be a better leader for everyone else so it really does start from your inside from yourself yeah, well, wonderful. Naz, it has been a really uh, great pleasure to to talk with you today. The time has flown by. Uh, before we close, though, I did want to give you a chance to share with listeners a little bit more about where they can find you, find your book, uh, and, and give us the last word on the topic for today. So everyone, you can find me at nazbeheshti.com, N-A-Z-B-E-H-E-S-H-T-I.com. My book is there. You can also find it on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, and all major retailers. And then my corporate wellness site is prananaz.com, P-R-A-N-A-N-A-Z.com. And I'm on all social media as Naz Beheshti on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. And then uh, Facebook is Naz Beheshti Speaker.com. And I'm also on Clubhouse as Naz Beheshti. So, um, and I just encourage you to take, take the um, first step in becoming the CEO of your well being. take charge of your life so that you could show up in all areas of your life and live your best life and start today if you haven't already. I love it. Amen. A wonderful message. We need to, to speak that and share that more and more and more. I think everyone needs it. Thank you for all the good work you do. Thanks for joining me today and for sharing your wisdom and your experience with all my listeners. I hope listeners will reach out, get connected with Naz, uh, check out her, her company, check out her book, find out more about what she can do to help you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. We are excited about the launch of HCI's new magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine designed to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We will be publishing issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Check out the first issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.